Okay, so this is the first video that's going to uh, deal with material from the sort of third, fourth uh, live classes. Uh, exactly how things get split up is going to depend on how things go, uh, assuming we're still doing this live by the time we come around to this part of the module. Um, and we're talking about this, this paper looking at uh, quantum tunneling through a, a barrier. And this is a phenomenon that we introduced last time, and we said that you know, if you want to see this experimentally with something big and heavy like an atom, we're going to need atoms that are moving very, very slowly because we need the wavelength associated with those atoms to be comparable to the size of the barrier, right? We need it to, to this product of kappa times L to be small, uh, which means we need a long wavelength uh, compared to the barrier. Uh, in order to do that, we need slow-moving atoms. That's what we learned from the de Broglie relationship between uh, momentum and wavelength, that the, the slower the atoms are moving, the longer the wavelength associated with them. So we need slow-moving atoms. Uh, and this brings us around to the, the sort of the second goal that we want to, to address in talking about this research article, is explaining how do they get the atoms that they use for their experiment, and how do they make the barrier that those atoms then tunnel through. So that's going to be the subject of the, the next little bit, and that's going to involve talking about how to make things cold. All right, so why are we talking about making things cold? Well, because temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of things making up uh, an object, of the atoms making up an object. So if I have a, a sample of hot gas, right, that, that contains fast-moving atoms. If I have a cold sample, that contains slow-moving atoms. And there's a very simple relationship between these things that are, uh, you can see at the, the top of the, the slide here, uh, that the kinetic energy, half mv squared, is equal to 3 halves times the temperature times a constant, this, this little case of b, uh, that's called Boltzmann's constant. And it's just the constant that converts from temperature to energy, right? It gets the units right. Um, so when I say fast-moving atoms, what am I talking about? Well, if I have a gas at room temperature, those atoms are moved, are at a temperature of around 300 Kelvin in, in absolute units, 300 degrees above absolute zero, if that's room temperature. Um, and they're moving at a speed of, you know, a few hundred meters per second, something comparable to the speed of sound. At that speed, the uh, wavelength associated with a uh, rubidium atom, which is the kind of atoms that are used in these experiments, at that speed, a rubidium atom would have a wavelength that's equal to 0 0.01 nanometers, or it's kind of a, a tenth the uh, diameter of an atom. That's right. The wavelength is smaller than the atom itself. So that's a very small wavelength. Uh, that's not so useful for uh, our purposes. Um, so what we want is a sample of atoms that are moving very slowly, right? We want mo atoms that are moving slowly. That means they're cold. And the question you can ask is, well, how cold do they have to be to be useful for this tunneling experiment? Um, so again, I'll remind you that our, our goal is to keep this pro product of kappa times L small, which means we want the wavelength of the, the atoms to be sort of comparable to the size of the barrier. And we know from looking at the abstract of the, this research article that the barrier they're using is about one micron thick, so one one millionth of a meter. So, you know, if we want a sort of ballpark estimate, what do we need to do to get atoms cold enough to be useful in a tunneling experiment with this? Uh, we want to ask, well, what temperature would we have to have to have the atoms have that de Broglie wavelength? Right, for the de Broglie wavelength of the atoms to be about one micron. Okay. Uh, you know, maybe you could do with a factor of two shorter, you know, half the wavelength. Maybe you could do with twice the wavelength. But something in that ballpark is going to be what we're looking for. And so that will give us an, uh, an estimate of what we're, we're shooting for. Um, this is a trick that we use all the time in physics to uh, sort of guess you know, so the parameters that we're going to be talking about to sort of uh, estimate the plausibility of an experiment. What, what do we need to do roughly, you know, within a factor of two, sort of, to get this, to, this thing to be able to work? These back-of-the-envelope estimates are a thing that's, that's very, very common in physics. And so we'll do, do a few of those in the course of, of this module. So if I want a de Broglie wavelength of around a micron, well, I'm going to use this. I, I want to know what that corresponds to as a temperature. I'm going to use this relationship between kinetic energy and 
uh, temperature. So I, I have here kinetic energy. Now I've rewritten it in terms of the momentum. So it's P squared over 2m uh, equal to 3 halves uh, kV times T. Right, and now I can take the uh, de Broglie relation between momentum and wavelength and, and use that to rewrite the momentum. And then I have on the left-hand side uh, h squared over 2 times the mass of the atoms times the wavelength we're looking for squared. And that's equal to the same 3 halves kT. Um, I can plug in the, the values of all these things. The atoms where we care about are rubidium-87 atoms. So they have a mass of 87 atomic mass units, which is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Uh, Boltzmann's constant is there in joules per Kelvin, and Planck's constant is there. You know, I do a little plug and chug uh, math here, and I get an answer for the temperature, which comes out to be uh, 73 nanokelvin. Right, 73 one billionths of a degree above absolute zero. Uh, the technical term for that is really freaking cold. Okay, so we need to somehow get these atoms down to extremely low temperatures, to nano Kelvin temperatures. Um, how are we going to do that? Well, the problem with this is anything other than helium is a solid, is frozen into a solid chunk by the time you get down to 4 Kelvin, 4 full degrees above absolute zero. Uh, and helium at that temperature is liquid, and those things are not useful to us, right? Solids and liquids, they're very strongly interacting uh, with each other, with the atoms in those, those uh, substances, uh, and that messes things up. We can't, we can't use solids, we can't use liquids to do these tunneling sorts of experiments. So we need some other way to get them cold, right? We, we need some other trick here. Um, the key idea is if we work at a very, very low density, right, so that, that we're talking about samples of gas that are, that are, you know, millions of times less dense than air, then this will remain too dilute to solidify, right? We'll have atoms that are moving very slowly, uh, but they only encounter each other very rarely. Uh, which means that they don't really know that there are all these other atoms around that they really ought to gang up with and form a liquid or form a solid. Right? So if we can work with extremely dilute samples, we can keep these things from, from liquefying or solidifying. Um, so the problem with that is that you can't cool samples that are that dilute by the usual methods. Right? I can't take this and dunk it in liquid helium uh, because it's so dilute that the liquid helium would just obliterate. So I need some way of making samples that can get extremely cold while remaining extremely dilute, which means I can't bring them in contact with any cooling agents, things like that. The technique for doing this is called laser cooling, and it uses light, right? We're going to cool atoms down solely by the action of light interacting with those atoms. Uh, and this is, as, as strange as the idea may sound, this is phenomenally successful. It was developed in the, in the 1980s. Uh, this is a very famous photo of laser-cooled atoms at NIST. Most of what you see there is the vacuum chamber in which the atoms are housed because we can't have them coming in contact with anything else. But if you look right in the center of that, that frame, there's a, a tiny little orangey blob right, just underneath the, the face of, of Chris Helmerson from NIST, who's looking through the chamber from the other side. That tiny little orange blob is, you know, tens of millions of sodium atoms cooled to a temperature of a few hundred millionths of a degree, uh, a few hundred one millionths of a degree above absolute zero. So laser cooling is a technique that gets atoms very, very cold while remaining a dilute gas. So uh, this is the technique that we, we want to work with. This is not as cold as we ultimately need, but this is the first step in the process of getting atoms cold enough to be able to do these tunneling, tunneling experiments. Um, so what are we talking about here? Uh, we're talking about taking atoms that at room temperature are moving at speeds of around the speed of sound, around 300 meters per second, so rattling around at, at extremely high speeds, and slowing them down to 100 microkelvin corresponds to a speed of maybe 10 centimeters per second, so about this fast. Right, sort of the speed of something that, that, that runs out of the, the way when you turn on the lights in your dorm room. Uh, hopefully not. Hopefully our dorms are much nicer than that. But it's about the, you know, the speed of a bug moving at, at high speed for a bug. Right. So that's what we're doing. And we're going to get atoms from the speed of sound down to the speed of an insect solely by using light. All right, how does that work? Well, the key idea here is this notion that atoms have uh, characteristic spectra. 
there's characteristic frequencies of light that they absorb and emit, right? And these, these occur at very narrow ranges of frequency or ranges of wavelength, as you see in the, the picture here. Um, this, is, this is first discovered in the early 1800s by uh, Joseph von Fraunhofer uh, and, and systematized in the 1860s. People realized that every element in the periodic table has its own unique set of these uh, frequencies, and people start using this to identify atoms. But it's not explained why this happens until uh, 1913. Uh, 1913, you get this Bohr model of, of uh, the quantum atom, uh, as introduced by Nils Bohr, who's then uh, working at the University of Manchester with Ernest Rutherford. Uh, and he proposes this uh, model that's not completely correct. It's not using the modern ideas of wave functions and Schrodinger equation and all that sort of thing, but he has the right concept. And what he says is there are certain special allowed states uh, for an electron orbiting the nucleus of an atom uh, in which the electron uh, just sits happily and doesn't emit any radiation. And that um, atoms absorb or emit light only when they move between these allowed states. Right? And that the frequency of light that they either emit if they're dropping down in energy or absorb if they're uh, moving up in energy is related to the, the energy difference between these states by the Planck rule. So the um, Planck's constant h times the frequency of the light absorbed or emitted is equal to the energy difference between the starting and, and ending orbits for the atom. Right. Again, this is not completely correct. Um, the, the actual picture is not you know, electrons moving in literal circular orbits around the nucleus, but it gets the right concept. Right? You, can, you can get through most of a major in chemistry just thinking of atoms using the Bohr model. So. Um, so, you know, it's the right ballpark. Right. This notion of, of uh, light driving transitions between allowed energy states in atoms is also the basis for laser cooling. Uh, and this happens because light carries momentum. Right? And we know that light has this particle character to it, because that's introduced by Max Planck and then Albert Einstein in the very early 1900s to explain a couple of other things that we're not really talking about in this class. Um, they introduced this, this idea of uh, photons that, that carry uh, a discrete amount of energy, h, the Planck's constant h times the frequency, or h times the speed of light divided by the wavelength of the, the photon. Um, but we also know from Einstein's uh, theory of relativity that there's a relationship between the energy of something and its momentum. Right? And there's this, this formula that uh, particle and nuclear physicists use all the time, that the, the energy is equal to the square root of the rest energy, mc squared, squared, plus the momentum times the speed of light squared. Right. Now, if you take that and you apply it to a photon, which by definition has zero rest mass, right? photons are never not moving, so the concept of rest mass means nothing for a photon, uh, this becomes a, a, a much simpler relationship. It's just the energy is equal to uh, the, or the, the energy is equal to the momentum times the speed of light, which means that the photon carries some momentum, even though it's a massless particle, it has momentum that's equal to the energy of the photon divided by the speed of light, or if you plug in the, the Planck-Einstein relation, it's just uh, the Planck's constant divided by the wavelength. And hey, look, that's exactly the same relationship between wavelength and momentum that Louis de Broglie introduced for uh, talking about electrons, talking about particles that have a, a, a wave character to them. So this is great, right? These things, uh, there's this, this beautiful symmetry between these things. And in fact, this is the reason why uh, de Broglie first introduced this idea of, um, mo of a wavelength that's related to the momentum of particles. Um, this is the basis for laser cooling because these photons carry this momentum and when a photon interacts with an atom it's going to transfer that momentum to the atom right which means that you know an atom absorbing a photon gets a little kick from that photon and will start moving in the direction that the photons is headed if the atom was initially stationary uh, that those little kicks from photon absorption are the basis for laser cooling. You can add up a lot of those and make a force, and that's how we're going to use lasers to make atoms move slowly and thus make them cold. All right. The details of how that works is going to be in the uh, in the, the next video, so stay tuned for that.